As in 1800, newspapers vilified each candidate in extremely abusive language. And so some newspapers made fun of Adams' slovenly dress. Other newspapers ridiculed Henry Clay as a drunkard and a gambler. Some newspapers charged William Crawford, who was Secretary of the Treasury, with malfeasance in office. And other newspapers accused Jackson of being a murderer for having authorized the execution of mutineers in 1813 and for having killed people in duels. Predictably, each section of the nation voted for a different candidate. And so <clears throat> this map shows that John Quincy Adams won the states in purple. <clears throat> And um, Jackson won the states in blue, Crawford won the states in green, and Clay won the states in yellow. But no candidate was able to get a majority of the 131 electoral votes needed to be elected president. And so as a result of the election, Jackson, who won the most popular votes of the four candidates, ended up with 99 electoral votes. John Quincy Adams, 84. William Crawford, 41. Henry Clay, 37. So <clears throat> in order to be elected, you needed a majority. And the simplest majority was 131. Well, although Jackson got the most popular votes and the most electoral votes, he was still 32 electoral votes short of the required majority. So according to the Constitution, the election was thrown into the House of Representatives. And in the House of Representatives, they had to choose among the top three candidates. So that meant that Henry Clay was out. But Clay was a kingmaker. And he was determined to prevent Jackson from becoming president. On the first, now when, when representatives vote in the House of Representatives, they vote collectively by states. And so there were 13, I'm sorry, there were um, 21 states at the time, uh, 24 states at the time. And so the winning candidate would have to win a majority of those states. On the first ballot, 13 states voted for Adams because Clay threw his support behind Adams. Jackson won seven states votes and Crawford won four. And so Adams became president. Adams' victory shocked Jackson's supporters who felt that Jackson should have won because he had the most popular votes and the most electoral votes. Jackson was particularly enraged when three days after Clay threw his support behind Adams, the new president appointed Clay as the Secretary of State. Jackson and his followers accused Adams and Clay of striking, excuse me, this was the result in the House of Representatives. So Jackson and his followers accused Clay and Adams of striking a corrupt bargain because Clay threw his support behind Adams and Adams made Clay Secretary of State. A pro-Jackson newspaper declared the following, expired at Washington on the 9th of February of poison administered by the assassin hands of John Quincy Adams the usurper and Henry Clay, the virtue, liberty, and independence of the United States. Jackson supporters branded Clay the Judas of the West. Now, there was never any solid evidence to prove that there was a corrupt bargain, but that allegation haunted Adams in his four years as president. The next election was 1828 and Jackson got his revenge in a rematch with Adams. Having lost the 1824 election, 
despite winning the majority of the popular votes, a vengeful Andrew Jackson was determined to win the 1828 election. Now this series of lectures focuses on the most consequential elections in American history, the races that produced the biggest changes and had the most lasting impact. And the presidential election of 1828 was consequential in several ways. The election witnessed the revival of the two-party system because Adams supporters organized a new party called the National Republicans. And Jackson's supporters called themselves Democratic Republicans or just Democrats. And so today's Democratic Party really originated with the election of 1848. From the first presidential election in 1789 until this election in 1828, every one of the seven presidents had been from either Virginia or Massachusetts. But by 1828, the balance of power was shifting westward and Andrew Jackson of Tennessee capitalized on that trend. The 1828 campaign was one of the dirtiest in American history. It set the precedent for future negative campaigns. It centered around the character issue of the candidates and it was marked by nasty mudslinging. Jackson's forces attacked John Quincy Adams as a corrupt politician, a monarchist, and an anti-Catholic bigot. Adams was accused of using an American servant girl to seduce the passions of Tsar Alexander when John Quincy Adams was the American ambassador to Russia. Jackson, Jackson's people also accused Adams of using public funds to buy gambling devices in the presidential re residence. It turned out that those gambling devices were a chess set and a pool table. Seems innocent enough, but the Jackson forces said that that was used for gambling. For their part, the backers of John Quincy Adams said that Jackson was a gambler, an adulterer, and a murderer. They published a pamphlet accusing the hot-tempered Jackson of 103 violent acts. Adams' supporters distributed what was known as the coffin handbills. That is, this handbill showing coffins of supposedly people whom Jackson killed. Um, they attacked Jackson for the execution of deserters when Jackson commanded his army and of massacring Indian villages and also people killed in duels with Andrew Jackson. During this campaign, Jackson's marriage came in under particularly vicious attack. Andrew Jackson married his wife, Rachel, in 1791. Now, Rachel was previously married, married, but she asked her husband for a divorce. And her husband informed her that the divorce went through. And so Rachel felt that she was legally now uh, entitled to marry Andrew Jackson. And they did marry in 1791. Unbeknownst to her, the divorce had not yet been finalized. And so they had to remarry once the divorce became finalized. But the supporters of John Quincy Adams claimed that when she first married Andrew Jackson, she was a bigamist because she was still legally married to her first husband. And so they depicted her as an immoral seductress. A pro-Adams newspaper editorial asked the question, ought a convicted adulteress and her paramour husband be placed in the highest offices of this free and Christian land? Well, first of all, she was not a convicted adulteress. And 
she was under the impression that the divorce had gone through. Nevertheless, Rachel thought that her reputation was ruined during the campaign. And in the time between Jackson's election and before Jackson took office, she died. And Jackson blamed Adams for dragging Rachel's name through the mud and causing her to have a fatal ner nervous breakdown. During the campaign, Jackson pushed the notion that elites from the Northeast had cheated him out of the White House in 1824. And like many presidential candidates since, Jackson pledged to protect everyday people from the rich and powerful. The Jackson campaign for the first time used slogans, political songs. They organized parades, barbecues, dinners, and street rallies. And at these political rallies, the consumption of alcohol was um, a regular routine. <clears throat> Jackson spent lavishly on flyers and printed advertisements. And his supporters referred to him as Old Hickory because of his strength and his determination. Hickory is a particularly strong uh, piece of wood. Uh, and so his supporters distributed hickory broomsticks and hickory canes. Now, during the election, class, social class, became a major issue. John Quincy Adams, after all, was the son of a president. He had been a Harvard professor and a former secretary of state. So he was certainly from the upper class. Andrew Jackson, on the other hand, born in a log cabin, claimed to be a man of the people, those who fought wars, those who opened the frontiers. And he claimed to promote the interests of farmers and artisans and tradesmen and laborers. Well, he certainly was born poor, but by the time he ran for president, he was a wealthy man uh, through his um, real estate uh, uh, engagements. 1828, was the first campaign in US history where contributors contributed over a million dollars. It was also the first campaign with known instances of ballot fraud. Wagon loads of Jackson supporters spilled over from Tennessee into Kentucky and Ohio to cast votes in names of citizens who had died. <clears throat> in the end, Jackson won 178 electoral votes to just 83 for the sitting president, John Quincy Adams. This election was remarkable in a number of ways. Here's a graph showing the percentage of eligible voters who voted. So in the 1824 election, just 27% of eligible voters voted. But in 1828, just four years later, 56% of eligible voters voted. And that's because four of the 24 states eliminated property requirements for voting. Before 1828, you had to own a certain amount of property to be eligible to vote. Jackson believed that voting rights should be extended to all white men. And so, his name became associated with Jacksonian democracy. In terms of absolute numbers, the Jacksonian era, this period from 1828 to 1840, was a high point of participatory democracy in America. So let's go back to that graph. Sorry, forget that in a second. Okay, so this graph again shows the percentage of eligible voters voting. This is the Jacksonian era from 1828 to 1840. And as you can see, by 1840, some 80% of all eligible voters voted. 
That was the highest percentage in American history with the exception of um, the 1880 election. Uh, 1880 election was a little higher. And so the Jacksonian era was a high point of participatory democracy in America. Um, but that didn't, that didn't impress Adams supporters. To Adams, the outcome of the election represented the victory of the mob, the common people. In fact, on the day of Jackson's inauguration, Jackson opened the White House to his supporters and an unruly crowd fueled by free liquor broke furniture and smashed dishes in the White House as they tried to get a glimpse of Jackson. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, the election of 1828 was significant in several ways. As I mentioned, it revived the two-party system. It also heralded the election of a man widely viewed as a champion of the common people. But that year's campaigning was also noteworthy for the intense personal attacks and wide, widely employed uh, attacks that were used by both candidates. And the 1828 election inaugurated the era of Jacksonian democracy. Jackson served two terms as president, 1828 to 1836. In 1836, he stepped down and <clears throat> his, um, his personal favorite to run under the Democratic Party was Martin Van Buren. And Martin Van Buren became elected president in 1836. In 1834, the Whig Party made its first appearance. And the election of 1840 pitted the Democrat Martin Van Buren against the Whig candidate, William Henry Harrison. Now this election of 1840 was far more civilized than the contentious contest of 1828. Yet it did have a degree of political aggressiveness. So I'm going to share with you a song that was featured in the 1840 election about Martin Van, Bureau, Van Buren. And it said, who never did a noble deed? Who of the people took no heed? Who is the worst of tyrants breed? Van Buren. Who rules us with an iron rod? Who moves at Satan's beck and nod? Who heeds not man? Who heeds not God? Van Buren. Who would his friends his country sell? Do other deeds too base to tell? Deserves the lowest place in hell? Van Buren. So uh, even though this election was less contentious than 1828, it's still, as you can see, was fairly vile. Um, Harrison won the election and thus he became the first Whig president. He won 234 electoral votes against just 60 for the Democratic candidate, Martin Van Buren. Now, when Harrison won the election, he was 68 years old, the oldest president up to that time. Ronald Reagan was elected president when he was 69. Whoever becomes elected president next month will be the oldest candidate ever elected president. And so Harrison was 68 years old and some people thought he was too old to serve as president. He took the oath of inauguration in March of 1841. It was a very cold day, but he wanted to show the American people that he was, although 68, very healthy. And so even though it was very cold, he took the oath of inauguration without an overcoat. 
Does this sound familiar to anyone today? A president who wanted to show people how healthy he was. Well, let me go back to 1841. As a result of this, Harrison caught pneumonia. And after only 32 days in office, he died. He was the shortest, that was the shortest term for any president. And this introduced what became known as the zero factor in American history. This is a lithograph of the death of William Henry Harrison. So what do we mean by the zero factor? Well, in 1840, Harrison died in office. The next presidential election year ending in a zero was 1860. Well, Lincoln won that election and he would be assassinated as president. The next presidential election ending in a zero was 1880 and James Garfield was assassinated the next year. The next presidential election ending in a zero was 1900. William McKinley was assassinated the following year. And then in 1920, Warren G. Harding was elected president and died while president in 1923. In 1940, Franklin D. Roosevelt won his third term as president and he too would die in office. And 1960, John Kennedy would be assassinated while president. Uh, now, this zero factor ended with Reagan's election in 1980, although, as you know, he was shot uh, one, less than one year into his presidency. Okay, so the next presidential election that we're going to look at is the presidential election of 1860. If there was any presidential election that is most similar to the upcoming election in November, it is the election of 1860. Both that election and this election occurred in a deeply polarized nation against a backdrop of unsettling and sometimes violent events. The election that is going to take place in a few weeks is taking place amid a pandemic, an economic crisis, a movement for social justice, and increasing violence between the political left and the political right. Similarly, the election of 1860 was preceded by a decade of division, discord, and violence. And it all centered around the issue of slavery. In 1850, Congress enacted a stronger fugitive slave law, which meant that if slaves ran away from the plantation and ran into the North where there was no slavery, the fugitive slave law said that slave catchers could go into free Northern states and reclaim their slaves. And Northerners were deeply offended that Southern slave catchers would come into their states. And sometimes these slave catchers would simply apprehend even free blacks and claim that they were runaway slaves. If you saw the movie, 12 Years a Slave, that was the theme. And the slavery issue became in inflamed two years later when Harriet Beecher Stowe published Uncle Tom's Cabin. And many Northerners were now, uh, becoming familiar with some of the brutal aspects of slavery. And then in 1854, the territory of Kansas and Nebraska wanted to come in as states. Now, previously in 1820, there was a compromise known as the Missouri Compromise that said that there shall be no slavery north of 3630, that's this dark line on this map, 3630. So the Compromise of 1820 said no slavery above 3630. But the South wanted there to be slavery in the Kansas and Nebraska territory. 
And so the Senator from Illinois, Stephen Douglas, then proposed what was known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which said that the people of the Kansas and Nebraska territory should vote as whether they want to have slavery or not. And as a result of that, pro-slavery forces swarmed into the Kansas and Nebraska territory and anti-slavery forces also moved into the Kansas, Nebraska territory in order to vote against slavery. And so you had these extremely opposed forces moving into the Kansas, Nebraska territory and before long violence erupted. It was called Bleeding Kansas. It was really a dress rehearsal for the Civil War as pro-slavery forces fought against anti-slavery forces. And it was against this backdrop that the Whig party disappeared because there were Northern Whigs and Southern Whigs and they disagreed over slavery. And a new party emerged in 1854, the Republican party. So the Republican party of today owes its origins to 1854. So as we can see in, in this uh, PowerPoint, slavery split the Whig party. Republican, the Republican party was founded in 1854 and it stood for one issue. And that issue was, it was opposed to the extension of slavery. It did not oppose slavery where it already existed in the South. It opposed the extension of slavery. And pro and anti-slavery forces were not just fighting each other in Kansas and Nebraska, but the fight was also on the floor of the Senate where a, an anti-slavery Senator, Charles Sumner was beaten over the head by a pro-slavery member of the House of Representatives. And then in 1857, the Dred Scott case, reached the Supreme Court. Dred Scott was a slave whose owner took him into the Wisconsin territory where there was no slavery. And so Dred Scott sued for his freedom, claiming that since his master had taken him to a territory where slavery was forbidden, he was therefore no longer a slave. Well, the case went up to the Supreme Court. And the court ruled against Dred Scott. Chief Justice Roger Tawney said in his decision, blacks have been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race. Therefore, blacks have no rights which white men are bound to respect. And so what this case decided was that Blacks should not be citizens of the United States. And that applied to free Blacks as well. And the final event prior to the 1860 election that inflamed racial feelings was the raid that John Brown conducted at Harper's Ferry. John Brown wanted to promote a slave insurrection and so he and his followers seized arms at this armaments factory um, in West Virginia. He was ultimately captured and put on trial. And uh, some people looked upon John Brown as a martyr who would die for the cause of ending slavery. People in the South saw him as the devil incarnate who was trying to end slavery. So that is the background to the election of 1860. Now let us get into the campaign itself. Two years before, the Senator from Illinois, Stephen Douglas was running for reelection and opposing him was Abraham Lincoln. 
Douglas had been a judge, a congressman, and a United States senator, whereas Lincoln was a well-known Illinois attorney, but his reputation was purely local. Everyone expected Douglas to win the debates, but in the end, it wasn't Douglas, but Lincoln, whom the people were listening to. There were seven debates in all, and this is a map showing where all seven debates were, and Lincoln won each of these debates. Nevertheless, in the election for Senator, he lost because that election was not up to the people. Before the 16th Amendment, state legislatures elected senators. And so the Illinois state legislature elected Stephen Douglas. So it seemed as if Lincoln's brief but inglorious political career was over. But as the 1860 elections loomed, some Republicans began to think of Lincoln as a possible candidate. And more and more people began to encourage Lincoln to run. And he even conceded, quote, the taste is in my mouth a little. That is the taste for political office. In February of 1860, Lincoln was invited to speak at Cooper Union in New York City. Now, people in New York expected to see a rough and uncultivated man from the West. Illinois at that time was considered the West. They thought that Lincoln would be a country bumpkin, hardly New York's conception of a finished statesman. But when Lincoln finished this speech, the audience was stunned. They were enthralled by what he had to say. Lincoln argued against the expansion of slavery, and he concluded by declaring, let us have faith that right makes might, and that in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. The audience went wild with applause, impressed by Lincoln's oratorical eloquence and his ability to connect with his audience. It was the success of this Cooper Union speech that catapulted Lincoln as a candidate for the 1860 presidential election. Meanwhile, the Democrats could not agree on a candidate. Ultimately, Northern Democrats nominated Stephen Douglas, while Southern Democrats demanded that the party support a candidate who is committed to slavery. And so Southern Democrats nominated John Breckinridge. Now, other Southern, Southerners wanted a unity candidate, a candidate that promised not to split the country. And they nominated a man by the name of John Bell under the Constitutional Union Party. But who would represent the Republicans? Well, the Republican convention met in Chicago in May of 1860. Lincoln's supporters promoted Lincoln as the rail splitter um, because Lincoln at one point in his career uh, chopped up lumber that was used for railroads. Um, and his supporters highlighted Lincoln's defense of free labor as opposed to slave labor. Now, most Republicans thought the nomination would go to William H. Seward of New York. Um, and he was far better known than Lincoln. In fact, Lincoln was less prepared than any other man who ran for the presidency up to that point. He lacked family wealth or tradition. He had only the briefest of formal schooling. At the age of 50, he had no administrative experience. He had never been a governor or a mayor. He served only a single unsuccessful term in the House of Representatives, and he had not held any public office over the past 10 years. He ran for Senate in 1855 and lost. He ran again in 1858 and lost. In this Republican flyer, we can see that Lincoln was not considered a major contender. 
This is a flyer of the contenders in 1860, and this is William H. Seward. You can see his picture is prominent in the middle of this flyer, whereas Lincoln is sort of off to the bottom. But nevertheless, Lincoln was the man who attracted most of the attention because of his oratory. Um, he also bribed delegates with promises that if he won, he would reward them. Now, Lincoln trailed Seward on the first and second ballot. But on the third ballot, the Ohio delegation switched its vote and Lincoln won the nomination. Now, um, it was a bitterly fought campaign. This was a campaign, remember, that had four candidates running. At that time, political campaigns was a source of entertainment. Political events ran the gamut from rallies to parades to picnics, fireworks, excursions, and sometimes there were even riots over political campaigns. The enthusiasm for these campaigns were like religious revivals, um, and they were like 20th century spectator sports. People all over the nation were paying attention as these four candidates sprinted towards the finish line. Southerners depicted Lincoln as a black Republican, a John Brown in sheep's clothing, and that his election would be a signal for a slave rebellion. And so here is this flyer showing the Democratic platform versus the Republican platform, which they said is for the Negro. Douglas accused Lincoln of favoring miscegenation, mixing of the races. Southern newspapers ridiculed Lincoln's physical appearance as reflected in this article from the Houston Telegraph. Lincoln is the leanest, lankiest, most ungainly mass of legs and arms and hatchet face ever strung on a single frame. He has the most unwarrantable abuse. He has most unwarrantedly abused the privilege, which all ha politicians have, of being ugly. In effect, it was really two separate elections. In the North, voters chose between Lincoln and Douglas. In the South, voters chose between John Breckinridge and John Bell. Southerners depicted Lincoln as a black Republican. Even the most reasonable Southerner agreed that a Lincoln presidency meant the end of any hope that new slave states would be added to the Union. And for that reason alone, Lincoln's name did not even appear on the ballot in Southern states. On election day, November 6th, 1860, this was the result. Lincoln in purple carried every Northern state plus California and Oregon leaving his three rivals to divide up the rest of the states. This election drew 82% of eligible voters. Lincoln won handily in the Electoral College, as you can see. He won 180 electoral votes to 72 for Breckenridge, 12 for Douglas, 39 for John Bell. But, he won only 39.8% of the popular vote. And that's because there were four candidates. So in other words, he won 1 million votes less than the com combined total of his three opponents. Lincoln did not win a single electoral vote in the Southern states. And so Southerners regarded Lincoln's election as the victory of a Republican party that was purely a sectional party. Southerners felt Lincoln is not the president of the United States, he's the president of the North. And so the question was, what would Southern states do now that the nation was led by a man 
who did not receive a single vote throughout the South. Lincoln was the first president ever elected with a minority of the popular votes. He won a plurality, but not a majority. And he faced a problem that none of his predecessors had to face. And that was how to preserve the nation, how to keep it from splitting apart. What happened in the four months from his election in November to his inauguration in March would represent the greatest crisis that this country has ever faced. During those four months, Lincoln received hate mail from the South. He was threatened with death. He was compared to the devil. Even his hometown newspaper was brutally critical of the president-elect. In addition, leaders from Southern states began to talk about leaving the Union. During this long interregnum between his election and his inauguration, Lincoln tried to assure Southerners that he had no intention of interfering with slavery where it already existed. Nevertheless, secessionist fever was widespread in the South. On December 20th, 1860, South Carolina announced it was seceding from the Union. And so here, South Carolina announced it was leaving in December of 1860. Over the following 40 days, one by one, the states of Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas voted themselves out of the Union. All these seven states in 10 at the bottom here. They elected Jefferson Davis as the president of a new political entity called the Confederate States of America. And when these states left the Union, they seized federal property. They seized post offices, military forts, arsenals. This is what Lincoln had to deal with when he embarked on a 12-day trip from his home in Springfield, Illinois, to the nation's capital in Washington. And this shows the route that the train took over these 12 days. En route, Lincoln was told that there was a plot to assassinate him as his train passed through Baltimore on the way to Washington. And so Lincoln traveled in an unmarked railway car and he arrived in Washington 10 days ahead of his, I'm sorry, 10 hours ahead of his scheduled arrival, virtually alone unannounced and unrecognized. Rumors spread that he had disguised himself in a woman's dress as he passed through Baltimore, as depicted in this cartoon. But these rumors were really unfounded. But the fact that he showed up in Washington unannounced and 10 hours ahead of schedule showed that he feared for his life. By the time Lincoln was inaugurated in March of 1861, eight other states had seceded. No president ever assumed office facing a greater challenge than Lincoln in March of 1861. And that is why the election of 1860 was the most important and the most divisive presidential election in American history. John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry a year earlier had brought the great American debate over slavery to a breaking point. Almost immediately following Lincoln's election, the Civil War began with the Southern attack on Fort Sumter in April of 1861. Now historians have debated whether there would have been a Civil War had Lincoln lost the election. In my opinion, Without a Lincoln victory in November of 1860, war would not have broken out exactly when it did and exactly how it did. Lincoln won the presidency after running on a platform of 
opposition to the expansion of slavery into the territories, whereas none of the other three candidates supported such a platform. So you might conclude that if any of the other three candidates won in 1860, the South would have had no reason to secede. But when we look at the escalating events of the 1850s, even before the election of 1860, it seemed apparent that the tensions over slavery had grown so great that eventually, sooner or later, war would have broken out as the only way to resolve the issue over slavery. Now we're going to turn to the last of the elections that we're looking at today, and that is the election of 1864. By 1864, the Civil War was in its third year, and it seemed to be a stalemate. The smartest minds in the country came to the realization that Lincoln could not possibly win re-election in 1864. Heavy, sorry, heavy casualties on the battlefield was so enormous, it shocked and horrified people on the home front. 600,000 Americans would die in the Civil War. That's Americans on both sides. Some people even suggested postponing or suspending the 1864 election during the Civil War. But the election went forward, making the United States the first nation ever to hold a general election during a major war. In fact, the presidential election of 1864 would serve as a referendum on the Civil War. At stake was not merely Lincoln's continued occupation of the White House, but at stake was the fate of millions of African Americans held to Southern bondage. Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, but while the Emancipation Proclamation seemed to free slaves, it didn't free those slaves that were in parts of the South that had not yet been conquered by the Union armies. The Republican convention met to nominate a candidate in June of 1864. And it was not a given that Lincoln's own party would nominate him to run again in 1864. For all of Lincoln's popularity, some politicians began to question whether he could be elected to a second term. The Republican newspaper publisher, Horace Greeley, wrote before the election, Lincoln is already beaten. He cannot be elected. We must have another ticket to save us from utter overthrow. One man who stepped forward expressing his interest in challenging Lincoln for the Republican nomination was his own Secretary of the Treasury, a man by the name of Salmon Chase. Some of you may be familiar with Doris Kern's book, Team of Rivals. This was a book about Lincoln's cabinet. Lincoln chose cabinet members whose views disagreed with Lincoln's views, team of rivals. And one of those rivals was Sam and Chase. Chase complained that Lincoln was too cautious and that if he were elected president, he would have moved more quickly towards emancipating slaves and he would use black troops to fight against the South. Well, Lincoln did decide to use black troops, but Chase said that decision came too late. Chase continued to campaign for his nomination, and that led Lincoln to fire him as Secretary of the Treasury. Lincoln said, quote, you and I have reached the point of mutual embarrassment in our official relations, which it seems cannot be overcome or longer sustained. So it didn't make sense for Lincoln to be running against Chase for the nomination and still to have Chase as his Secretary of the Treasury. But at this critical juncture, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger Tawney, died in October 
just a month before the election. So to get rid of Chase as a competitor, Lincoln chose Chase as the new chief justice. Now, despite the problems he had with Chase, Lincoln appointed him because he knew that Chase would stand by the Emancipation Proclamation. The Democrats nominated for president Lincoln's nemesis, General George B. McClellan. He was the former Union commander in chief whom Lincoln fired in 1862 because Lincoln felt he was not moving quickly enough against the South. In fact, Lincoln said that General McClellan has a case of the slows. McClellan criticized the Republicans for making emancipation one of the goals of the war. And McClellan proposed to end the war with a negotiated peace. Well, what did a negotiated peace mean? It meant that the war would come to an end, but that slavery would remain intact in the South. So that's why this election was so critical. If the Democratic candidate won, slavery would have continued. Less than three months before the election, Lincoln seemed to have lost all hope. He wrote in a private memorandum stating his feelings. He wrote, quote, it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be reelected. Because as I mentioned, the Civil War was in a stalemate. He confided to a federal Republican, you think I don't know I'm gonna be beaten? But I do. And unless some great change takes place, I will be beaten badly. Well, at the darkest moment on September 3rd, 1864, two months before the election, Lincoln received the telegram from General Sherman announcing, Atlanta is ours and fairly won. The Union victory in Atlanta, which was an important railroad and manufacturing city, was one of the most important military accomplishments of the war. It really was the turning point. Unionist fervor was revived and Lincoln's spirits were uplifted by the news. The 1864 was as brutal as the 1860 campaign. Lincoln was subjected to almost unprecedented abuses in the oppositional press. Lincoln named as his vice presidential running mate, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee. And he named the Southerner because Lincoln wanted to bring the country together again at the end of the Civil War. The New York world ridiculed the Lincoln Johnson ticket stating in a crisis of the most appalling magnitude requiring statesmanship of the highest order, the country is asked to consider the claims of two ignorant boorish third rate backwoodsmen, backwoods lawyers for the highest stations in the government. Such nominations are an insult to the common sense of the people. God save the Republic. And Democrats continued to play the race card. They portrayed Lincoln as promoting racial intermarriage. And so here is a campaign poster called the Misogynation Ball. And as you can see, it shows blacks and whites dancing together. And this banner, universal freedom, one constitution, one destiny, Abraham Lincoln. So this was a democratic poster that is trying to convey the me message. If you elect, re-elect Lincoln president, then uh, blacks are gonna be free to marry with whites and there's going to be interracial uh, children being born. And so, it was used as a fear tactic. Now, on the McClellan supporters also used invectives to describe Lincoln. Here's a list of the adjectives that were used against Lincoln. Now, on the Republican side, Cartoonists disparaged General McClellan in comparison to Lincoln. 
Against McClellan's demands for a negotiated peace, Lincoln and the Republicans campaigned on the theme of no peace without victory. This 1864 campaign ribbon shows the now clearly understood twin goals of the war, union and liberty. Now, Lincoln had enormous support among the soldiers. They regarded him as Father Abraham. And the election that took place on November 8, 1864, resulted in an overwhelming victory for Lincoln and for the Republicans. Lincoln won every state except for New Jersey, Delaware, and Kentucky. So he won every state in the rose color on this map. Now, the Confederate states, of course, didn't vote in the 1864 election because they had left the Union. And so only New Jersey, Delaware, and Kentucky voted for the Democratic candidate, McClellan. Lincoln captured 55% of the popular vote. That was the largest majority popular vote since Andrew Jackson in 1828. So you can see that Lincoln won 2.2 million popular votes against 1.8 million for George McClellan. And Lincoln won 212 electoral votes to 21 for McClellan. Lincoln regarded the outcome of this election as an endorsement for his policy to restore the Union without slavery. After the election, Harper's Magazine ran a cartoon with an extraordinary tall Lincoln with the caption, Long Abraham Lincoln, a little longer. So some reflections on this election of 1864. No nation had ever held an election during a civil war. And no president since Andrew Jackson had won a second term. During this campaign, Lincoln was pressured to drop emancipation as a condition for peace with the South. But Lincoln refused. He declared, quote, I should be damned in time and eternity if I were to return to slavery the black warriors who have fought for the Union. And soon after the election of 1864, Congress adopted the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery. And that could not have happened without Lincoln's victory. And so <clears throat> that concludes the lecture for today. And 